How you doing guys? Welcome to another video. This is the last one in the biochemistry series. Hope you've enjoyed. Let's finish it off. Stereochemistry in biomolecules. Let's go. So, volume 11, stereochemistry in biomolecules. We need to look at chiral amino acids, L&D sugars, and some vision chemistry. It's quite a few IB understandings and applications, so make sure you have a read. We'll cover them off in this video. Um, but make sure you do understand them because the IB could target them. Okay, amino acids. Well, amino acids are essentially chiral molecules. That carbon that is connected to the R group has four different substituents coming off it, except when we have glycine because the Z group would be a hydrogen and that would make it a non-chiral carbon. This means that amino acids are optically active and they exist as two different stereoisomers. So for example, alanine, alanine exists generally in the L form in proteins and you won't find it in proteins in the D form. Now, the L and D stand for the way the isomer is arranged. The IB don't necessarily need you know, to know how to label them, but they do need you to know that the L form is the one that is in naturally occurring proteins. If we set this out with the chiral carbon being that carbon in the middle, we can draw in the Z groups and we can see that we will have two stereoisomers for alanine and those would be optically active. So we could separate them based on their optical activity. Remember, there will just be mirror images of each other. Unsaturated fatty acids and oils contain a carbon to carbon double bond. And due to that double bond, there's restriction in the double bond, so we have our cis and trans isomers. Cis meaning that they're on the same side and trans meaning they're on opposite sides. And the trans fatty acids are the long straight chain ones where the cis ones usually have a kink in the chain. Trans tend to pack together more tightly so they're usually solids, whereas the cis can generally tend to be liquids because they can't pack in as tightly. So here we have cis oleic acid. Oleic acid is found in peanuts, one of my favorites. The trans variety would be where the functional groups are just across the double bond from each other. Um, drawing those two out, we now have the cis and now we have the trans isomers. Now, hydrogenation of fats takes place in the food industry where we add hydrogen across the double bond using a nickel catalyst. So what we want to do is perform an addition reaction to break the double bond and now make a saturated fatty acid. So if I was to draw this saturated fatty acid, I would just start with the double bond and then I would show that there's a hydrogen added across the double bond and it now becomes a saturated molecule. I could now just combine those two things to make it the molecular formula, but I wanted to show that now instead of having just one hydrogen attached, the double bond's broken and we have two. That's known as an addition reaction because we're adding hydrogen across the double bond. Now, when they do this in the food industry, we don't get full hydro hydrogenation. Only some of them will convert. Now, that means that the rest of them often get chemically modified from the cis position to the trans position, resulting in trans fatty acids in processed foods in higher degrees. Consumption of those high trans fatty acids diets leads to raises the level of LDL, low density lipoprotein. Low density lipoprotein can sometimes be called low density, low LDL cholesterol, and that's the bad cholesterol. HDL cholesterol is what we associate with good fats, and LDL is associated with bad fats. If we have too many bad fats in our system, that can lead to artery and heart diseases. We have some stereochemistry in carbohydrates. Carbohydrates contain a number of chiral carbons. The stereoisomers are again referred to L and D, and for sugars with more than one chiral carbon, we refer to the chiral carbon that's furthest away from the ketone functional group or the carbonyl functional group. So from the data booklet, we've been given the straight chain glucose molecule and we have our carbonyl carbon at the top and our chiral carbon that's the furthest of the way is the one down the bottom. Now L and D refer to this carbon, this chiral carbon. With the OH being on the right hand side, that is the D form of the sugar. With the OH being on the left, that's the L form of the sugar. I've drawn that one in because D sugars are the most frequently found in nature. 
You could be asked to draw the L sugar for the carbohydrate glucose, and all you would do is copy it out from the data book, and remember that it's that last chiral carbon where the OH is now on the left hand side. Just remember the trick L, meaning the OH on the left hand side, and there we would have our other stereoisomer. So we would call this L glucose, and the other one D glucose. Okay, in B4 we looked at carbohydrates and we know that they also exist in the ring structures. Now from the formation of these ring structures, we get two other isomers known as the alpha and beta. From the data book, you're given alpha glucose and depending upon the position of the hydroxy group at the C1 carbon or the C2 carbon on fructose, it depends whether or not it lies above or below the chain, whether it will be alpha or beta. Now the alpha group is denoted when the OH is below the plane and the beta form of the molecule is described as the OH being above the ring. So in the first one we have alpha glucose, I've labelled that with the, the, the green, it's below the chain. And then for the second one, our OH, if we were drawing the beta glucose, the OH would be above the plane. It's the same for fructose, except fructose we only have a five-membered ring rather than a six-membered ring, and we're looking at the CH2OH group. So we have alpha fructose as the first one, and then if we flip those around, we would have beta fructose with the hydroxide group above the plane of the ring. Now, these are important because we can now form polymers of alpha and beta gl glucose and they form two very different structural polymers. Alpha glucose polymerizes to starch in plants and glycogen in animals, while beta glucose polymerizes to produce cellulose. Starch and glycogen are relatively compact spiral structures that are the energy storage in plants and animals, and it exists as an unwinded polymer. What you'll notice is that all of the linkages are linked in the same way. There's no change in the, in the relationship between the glucose molecules. They're simply just linked one after the other. Whereas cellulose, cellulose is a polymer of beta glucose. And it's a linear polymer, but with a different angle from the links in glycogen or starch. The glucose molecules are upside down, so they come one in this way, and then the other one comes in this way, and then that one comes in that way. And what they do is that allows them to form hydrogen bonds with other cellulose chains lying in parallel. So we get this kind of up-down linkage situation rather than just the monomers being linked in a straight line. That changes the properties of the polymer Starch and glycogen are energy stores where cellulose is mainly used for plant cell walls. So the cellulose is a structural component of plants and it's what gives it, it, gives it the strength and the ability to set, stand up. So it's the main supporting component in plant cells. We also digest gluco, uh, starch, glycogen and cellulose very differently. In fact, cellulose, because of its unwinded linear structure, it can form cables called microfibrils, and then the parallel chains all link together to make it quite a strong compound. Now, people can digest starch and glycogen. We have the enzymes to do that. Except people cannot digest cellulose because of its different structure and strength, and it's known as dietary fiber. You need dietary fiber in your diet because it helps with constipation, hemorrhoids, and helps to reduce colon cancer. So if we get unprocessed plant foods, that's a good source of fiber. Now the US, they have money that is made from cellulose. And in fact, if your dog eats some of your money in America, like this puppy has down here, you can actually retrieve the money. So on the left hand side, I've got an actual picture of some money that's gone through a dog's di uh, digestive system and you can still get it back, which is kind of gross, but whatever. Okay, vision chemistry. If you eat carrots, does that make your sight better at night? Well, not particularly, no. But a chemical called beta carotene is found in carrots and that's converted into retinol, which is found in your eyes in the vision cells called rods. At the tip of these cells, we find this 
protein molecule called rhododipsin, and this consists of another protein called opsin, which is tightly bound to retinal. So retinal is kind of coiled into this opsin. When light shines on the protein, the retinal stretches out from its cis to transform. So we have a cis retinal and a trans retinal, and the light will either will stretch that retinal out. So we have this interconversion. The light reacts with the cis and stretches it out to form the trans due to the double bond. When the rhododipsin, which contains opsin and cis retinal, is exposed to light, the, the light stretches out the retinal molecule to the trans retinal. This causes the optic, the isomer to dissociate from the opsin, which triggers an impulse. That impulse is what we see as light. So for instance, we have our rhodopsin, and then with light coming in, it releases it into opsin and trans retinal, so it stretches out the retinal, and then that triggers a nerve impulse in our brain, and we see that as light. Then enzymes catalyze the reaction back to the cis form, the branched form, and then it relinks with, up with its opsin, and then it is converted back into the initial protein. And this cycle can go around and around, allowing us to see light over and over again. Okay, volume 11, some top tips. This is the most biology I've ever done, but I've tried to stick to the chemistry as much as possible. I suggest having a look at the textbook as well. Make sure you check the data book for the structures. I've got a few more of these. I don't think I'm gonna try and eat them, and I'm definitely not gonna give them to the dog because I don't wanna pick them up. Anyway, thanks for watching. Don't forget, drop a like on the video, subscribe for more, and I'll see you.